Although they said, if there's a perfect church, don't join it, because it'll no longer be a perfect church, of course. Um, uh, but this is um, uh, a summary of the perfect church. The worship is perfect. The problems are non-existent. The personnel vibrant. Barry Tone is the superb director of music, ably assisted by his associate, Benny Dictus, and a superb band, the Magnific Cats. Neil Down is the director of pastoring. Percy Veer coordinates the evangelism. An exercise is, is a strict rule over the training. An exercise in a strict rule over the train is Ben Dover. Sally Forth maintains the missionary interest. Benny Factor handles the money, while Dynamite is a church coordinator. And Supreme, Supreme, I should say, is the rector's assistant. And the rector being a firm and no-nonsense individual by the name of Dick Tate. However, we recognize the reality of church life is very different. Sometimes a more nightmarish yet often most true life team, he said, might include Mark Time, Peter Out, Molly Coddle, and the gossip Die Vulge. Yes, very true. <laughs> uh, we're looking at the church this morning again, uh, what God wants us to be, what God has enabled us to be, um, uh, who we are in God, who we are in Christ, um, and, and the power with each other. I was just reading, um, if you remember, um, uh, he was called the, the um, not Eddie the, it might have been Eddie, Eddie the Eel. If you remember back in 2000, at the Sydney Olympics, um, in the Olympics, for some events, they, they invite people from different parts of the world or, or just to include them. Um, I remember watching um, uh, the 100 meters many years ago, and a, a man from American Samoa, well, he was about 25 stone, and uh, they let him run the 100 meters. Well, of course, they'd finished, and he was still halfway down, just to encourage them. And this guy was from Equatorial Guinea. He was black, and he'd, he'd, they asked him to swim the 100 meters. He'd only ever practiced in a 20-meter pool, and he was about as good as me swimming. In fact, I'd probably just about manage him. He swam 50 meters, and uh, he, he started coming back, and he, he was struggling. He was, he, was, he was dropping under the water, and he, he, was, he was just paddling, really. But you know what? The crowd there, because he, he, he swam on his own, because he, uh, I think yeah, he was on his own, the crowd began to stand to their feet and begin to cheer and applaud and just get... And eventually, he, he made it to the end, grabbed onto the end with dear life. And they interviewed him after. He said, you know what? Without the crowd, without the, the cheering, without the encouragement... He said, I would not have got to the end. <laughs> and uh, sometimes we are like that, and we? We are treading water. That's where we come together and say, God is good. You, you are a child of the living God. And that's amazing. And God is the God who builds the church. It is his, his people, the called out people, the assembly. And he, first of all, he's the one building the church. Now, of course, we'll see in a minute that we build together with him, but he is the one who builds. The Bible says, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested, a tested, a precious, costly stone, and the foundation uh, that will be firmly placed. And he who believes in him will not be disturbed or ashamed or shaken. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates, remember the gates, we talked about the authority, the, the working, the gates of hell will not prevail. Um, and in the context of that particular thing, he was talking about who he was. Because remember, Peter, he said, who, who do people say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, Peter, on this rock, Peter, you will be called rock. Remember, that's a small rock. On this rock, a large rock, not on Peter, as some say, Catholics say, not on Peter, on this rock, on that statement that who Jesus is, I will build my church. So he is the, is the precious cornerstone. He's not just the cornerstone, the Bible says, but the capstone. Of course, in, in the olden days, the cornerstone was the very first stone to be laid. It was the foundation stone. It set the strength and the structure and the, and, and the way how it was going to be situated and settled. Once that was settled, then you could build your building. And of course, the capstone uh, is the last stone you put in the archway to finish off. Uh, that's why the Bible says Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. 
Now, Jewish rabbis, uh, because you find this particular verse in Psalm 118, the, the, the stone the builders rejected would become the capstone, the cornerstone. They understood it was a prophetic word for the Messiah. That's why when Jesus said, I am the precious stone, you rejected me, but I am the true precious cornerstone. And interesting, when Peter, in Acts 9, when he stands before them, remember Peter's an ignorant uh, fisherman, but he knew the word. He spent three years with Jesus, and Jesus had taught them and got him into the word. And uh, he said to them, again, the precious cornerstone that you rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. And uh, they, they were taken aback, taken aback of this, who he is, uh, because we are the, he's building the church. Of course, as we said last week, we're a body, a building, bride, flock. Um, all these words, what's that word there? Oh, branches, of course, yeah, from the vine and the gardener. Lots of different metaphors to tell us who we are, who we're meant to be. God is building his church. God is building. Ephesians 2 said we are children of God, now and fellow citizens of God's household. We, we make up. God is the builder, but the Bible says we are living stones. We are live stones. And uh, remember that statement, ought to be a brick. He's a brick. Um, what does that mean? To be faithful, to be steadfast, to be consistent. Um, that's what God longs for us to be. He longs for you to be who you can be in him. He's building. He's building. God's longing to build his church, and he's doing that in us and through us. And he said, uh, the whole, um, let me read it. Sorry, I got it in big letters. Um, Ephesians 2. Consequently, you're no longer aliens, foreigners, no, 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 but fellow citizens of God's members of God's household, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. There's our foundation on his word, on his word, with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is fitted, joined together, and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in, two, in, in him too, you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. See, Although this is the building we meet in, of course, we know full well that we are the church, that Christ is now. We, now we come together because God commands it, demands it. You no, know, when people say, oh, no, 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 you're misunderstanding misunderst God's word and, you, and you're diluting it and distorting God's word. God says you've got to come together to, to build each other up. We'll just look in a moment. And, uh, but God is building us to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, when he said that, the Jews were taken aback. Because he used the word for the holy of holies, the naos, the holy of holies. And they understood that God dwelt in the holy of holies, and only one man, once a year, could go into that place. It was so sacred. They understood that people had gone in there or, or, or uh, messed about in, in the holy of holy place and had been consumed. Even Aaron's two sons had been consumed. And uh, if you read about the high priest, the high priest would have bells around his head, and he would have a, a rope tied around his ankle. You say, what's that for, Dave? Well, the bells were there to make sure he was still alive. And if he did drop dead, they wouldn't have to go into the Holy of Holies to get him out. They'd drag him out. <laughs> so they, when God says, you will be the holy, the, the, that awesome place, they were taken aback that we Ordinary human beings, sinful human beings, could actually become the temple of the Lord. God is building this amazing place. Never under the devil would lie to us. Oh, Dave, what, a, what impact do we, what a, how, how feeble we are? Well, look, God is building his church. Our job is to get on the right foundation. The Bible says no other foundation laid yet that in Jesus Christ and who he is. I love that verse. Uh, we are living stones. We just read it in 1 Peter 2. Living stones and who we are. Royal priesthood, holy nation, a chosen people. The devil can come and whisper. We did it on Thursday, and we need again I encourage you day by day to pray over there, speak over those things, speak the word over your life, isn't it? Speak God's word over your life. That's so vital because God's word counteracts the world's thinking, my own thinking, and my own ways that bring me down. But God's word, we are, we are. God says, you know, not you may be. Now, there's a lot of working out because we're looking tonight about God sees his people as righteous, doesn't he? 
Because the Bible says he, he gives it's a great exchange. He gives us his righteousness. But that doesn't mean we are living righteously. Because that's then a process of, it's called imputed and imparted. Then, then we begin to change. But God sees us. There's that imputation. Because you know what? We couldn't do anything to get righteous. God puts it into our account. And then we begin to see clearly and we begin to live differently. And we begin to live righteously. But at the moment of salvation, you are not living righteously, are we? And sadly, some of us have been walking a long time with the Lord and still... <laughs> There's a little lack of righteousness sometimes. But God, God loves us. God, who we are in him. God is building his church. He is the cornerstone. He is the capstone. And we are laid on him. No one else, nothing else. That's where we find our strength and our foundation. But the Bible says also, um, we are to edify ourselves. The Bible says, God has given the ministry gifts what to do to edify, to actually perfect, to bring you to a point where you are complete, that you have been built up, unity and fruitfulness and maturity. That's why we said last week you cannot function or fulfill your potential outside of being in, in, in church. Because the Bible, that's how God has made it. The, 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 the ministry gifts to build us up, to edify. What's the spiritual gifts to do? The Bible says, get after prophecy. Seek after prophecy. What does that do? It edified, it exhorts, it encourages. That's what it does. It edifies. For you who have been baptized and speak in tongues, you need to do that daily. Why? Because it edifies you. Some of you have neglected that. You need to do it day by day. And if you have not, seek the Lord with all your heart. Edify yourself. Oh, bless the Lord. Fellowship. Fellowship edifies. Edifies us. The Bible says... Um, when we come together, encourage each other to love and good deeds. Spur one another on. Spur one another. Sometimes we spur one another on the wrong way. But, but what does the Bible say? Bear with one another. Oh, here we know. We don't like that one. Romans 15. Bear with one another for your edification. Romans 15 too. Bear with one another. Uh, don't please yourself. And that's the problem, isn't it? Um, we were talking the other day about... Um, uh, when we understand about church and we covenant, we are in covenant with God. God, because it's based all on covenant, his promises. And when we understand that, we are in covenant with each other. That changes the perspective, isn't it? What do we say so often? I would, I'd be, again, I've been in church all my life, but most, most, not always, because God, uh, you know, moves us and uh, stirs us and changes our gifting and changes our, our, our location, of course. But most, most people uh, move churches because they don't enact God's word. They don't live on God's word. And uh, you, can, you can say, well, I'm, I'm telling you, this is so true, isn't it? We don't live out God's word. Because if we did, it'd be a different place. So we're edifying each other. We're building each other up. Even bearing with one another. By faith, we build each other. And our words, what does Ephesians 4 say? Let your words not be rotten or worthless or corrupt, but let your words be good, beneficial, for the building up of one another. Now, that doesn't mean we say things are not true. Of course it isn't. But as we remember, we read, speaking the truth in love. Now, I, I, as I said before, I, I can say things to Jackie and, and be honest with her, but my mother used to say to me many times, tone, David, tone, David, tone. It's as true, isn't it? It isn't what we say. So often it's how we say it. And uh, I'm still learning, slowly. Amen. But God says, build yourself. Build one another up. Bless the Lord. He's building on him, in him, through him. But because we are living stones, we are building each other up. We, we are con interconnected. Um, we said it before about the, the wall. That one brick. And go outside and count. It's connected to at least six other bricks, isn't it? You know, I can have a think about it. Okay, so we're interconnected. We can't be. But God is building. God is building His church. More than that, God is building, changing, but God is blessing His church. Zechariah 2, verse 8 says of the Jews, if they touch you, 
they touch the apple of my eye. Um, uh, that's an interesting fra phrase because that's where we get the phrase from, from the Bible. It's never been, it wasn't used before that. Um, the apple of my eye. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Uh, which means that precious. We are precious to him. And when we begin to see who we are in him, we are under his blessing. What did Jabez say? Lord, oh, that you would bless me. He understood that separated everything from him. The favor of God, the pronouncement of the blessing and the favor and the presence of God on our lives. Of course, in the Old Testament, it meant physical things, things you could see. But the New Testament is far greater than that, isn't it? And uh, sadly, many people have stayed in the Old Testament. But, you know, when we understand that all, all the the things, that, the blessings that we think are blessings, God says, what did Jesus say? The amassing of things is rubbish. It doesn't mean anything. But God is into blessing us spiritually and character and fruitfulness and being who we can be. God is the God of blessing. What does the Bible say? He's blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. There's nothing you should be in need of this morning. Nothing you should be in need of. Well, the Bible says God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. God is a God that blesses us. Now, sometimes we, we, we again, misunderstand blessing. But blessings can be difficulties. God brings difficulties in our life as a blessing. Oh, Dave, what are you on about? Of course it is. Because through the difficulties, what do we do? We lean on God. We depend on God. We actually begin to start to pray again like we've stopped praying. And God brings difficulties and hardships for us to get to see our need of him. Because by nature, when things are going pretty well, most of us coast, don't we? We just muddle along. We're not really seeking God as we should. We're not listening to him as we should because everything is going pretty good. And that's by nature most people. And uh, I, yeah, I'm pretty like that. If everything's going well, uh, thank you, Lord. I'm you know, doing all right, but not really pressing in. And God, the blessing of God, God's blessing is ours in him. He started uh, the kingdom manifesto. What did he say? Blessed are those poor in spirit. His last words before he went back to heaven, the Bible says he blessed his, his disciples and he left. God's a God that wants to bless us. He's the God who wants to put his hands on us and his arms around us. Why? Because he purchased us with his own blood. Ephesians 5 um, uh, shows us that picture, isn't it? Of, uh, of course, we're his body. And um, we are to look after our body, of course. And, and he gives a picture of the body and of the bride. And the, and the Bible says, doesn't, doesn't a man look after his body, feed it and protect it? And he said, if, if, if someone does that, how much more I will bless you. I will bless you and put my hands upon you. And God longs to do that. Husbands love your wife just as much as Christ loves you and gave himself for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word and present her to make himself a radiant church in the same way husbands ought to love your wives as their own bodies after all no one ever hated his own body but feeds and cares for it listen just as christ does for the church for we are members of his body god is a god that not just builds his church but blesses his church amen we are blessed this morning you say, well, Dave, I don't know. What does the Bible say? Je uh, Psalm 32, blessed are those whose sins are forgiven, whose iniquities are covered. You know, if you're living in, in, with all the weight of the world on you this morning, if you're his, you're blessed. Because the Bible says, what did, what did Paul say? Like, and he, remember, he had a lot more difficulty than me and you. Uh, those momentary troubles, momentary troubles are gone in a moment. I'm into glory. Even if they last for the lifetime, but most of them don't, do they just last a temporary amount. Because we think when we're in, in something, oh, it's going to last forever. This is going to be difficultly forever. Oh, no, 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 no. We are blessed of God. We are under his blessing, the first and last. And the Bible says we can be blessed. How do, how do we get blessed? We position ourselves, of course. We pursue it. What does the Bible say? Psalm 1, the first psalm. Blessed is the man who, who, blessed is the man who does not walk the counsel of the wicked, or stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight 
is in the law of the Lord. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his presence? He was a clean hand, pure heart, not lifted up his soul to vanity, not sworn what is deceitful. This is the one who receives the blessing of the Lord. What? The one who seeks him. And I love this because he, he drops in this, even Jacob. Remember, we talked about Jacob, didn't we? I, I love that because he could have said, even Israel, and, and they would have said, oh, yes, that's our promised name. But even that snake, Jacob, who seeks God, who, put, who positions himself, comes under the blessing of God. And the blessing of God is not having all the world, nice things and, and, the, and the wonderful things. The blessing of God is the favor of God to, the, to the actually changing us and to be a blessing. What 1 Peter 3 says, you are blessed. That's your inheritance. But your blessing is to be, your blessing is to be a blessing. Jacob was blessed to become a blessing. Genesis 32, of course, his blessing was not just a change of name, but a change of nature, wasn't it? Changing. God longs to change us. The blessing of God. And, and in, in Genesis 49, he blesses his sons. Why? Because he, he received the blessing. He's living in the blessing of God. Joseph himself was blessed and became a blessing to those around. God loves us blesses us. More than that, he's in, in the business of, what's the last one? Beautify. That's a lovely word, isn't it? Beautify. Why? Because we here are his bride. And um, uh, that's coming along pretty soon. And, um, you know, you brides know what it means, isn't it? You, 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 everything has got to be perfect. So that morning, uh, us men just get up have a shower, have a shave, put our suit on, turn up. You ladies, six o'clock in the morning, what have we got? Hair, makeup, nails, goodness knows what. Um, that dress, uh, you know, uh, uh, what about if you woke up in the morning and there was there, someone had dropped something on that dress and, and couldn't be, oh, it would be a nightmare, wouldn't it? Or if you woke up in the morning, you had a a big spot, a big zit coming on your nose. Oh, it would be awful. Um, and, but you see, the Bible says God is going to present us spotless, without blemish, absolutely whole. And so you say to me, Dave, he's got a lot of work to do. He certainly has. But he's into beautifying us. He's into changing us. What is the Bible? What is what we say? Uh, he's interested in our ultimate holiness, not our current happiness. Now again, we've, we've, we've portrayed Christianity as, as happy, clappy. Well, let me tell you, there's a joy that cannot be taken away. There's a peace that is beyond understanding. Um, there's a hope that cannot be taken away from us. But when it comes to happiness, that's all to do with happenings and circumstances. And that can change. That can change all the time. And so when we talk about happiness, no, no, no. But the joy of the Lord why? Because we are his. Can't be altered. Can't be changed. So, but he's into, into sanctify. The word is, uh, the old word is sanctify. To make us holy. To make us like him. Thankfully, again, the Bible says that, in, that happens as soon as we come to know him. What, is the, what does he say to the Corinthians church? This is what you were. You were drunkards. You were idolaters. You were... Um, greedy, you were thieves, some of you were homosexual, some of you were this, that, and the other. This is what you were, but now you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. This is what you were. Uh, but of course, the outworking of that is, the Bible says, be holy as I am holy. It's, not, it's, it's God's heart, God's command for you to be more like him, and he's in the, in the process of sancti beautifying us. So we can be presented without spot, without blemish, without, without what about this one? Without wrinkle. Woo! Bless the Lord. And uh, depending on how old we are, uh, we, we all got those, haven't we? God. What did Paul say? I betrothed you to one. And I betrothed you to one so you'd be pure and chaste before him. Before him. Thankfully, the Bible says, uh, although God is in the business of um, his will for us, his command, his purpose is, is to be um, holy. 
thankfully, again, he's given us the ability to purify ourselves. It's to be intentional, isn't it? To be intentional. What does the Bible say? My word purifies you. God's word, why? Because God's, as we, as we absorb God's word, the Holy Spirit applies God's word to our life. If we'd have let him, of course, we can't. I was just reading a story about uh, the, the um, Soviet dictator, let's call him a dictator, that's what they were, Khrushchev. Remember Khrushchev? Long before me and you, but in the 50s, Khrushchev, wasn't he? But Khrushchev was brought up in church. And you know what? Um, he learned the Gospels off by heart. Four of them, off by heart. And he was given prizes and all the things in, in church in, in those days, Sunday school. But you know what? Khrushchev turned his back on God. And uh, that was an atheistic state, even declaring there's no God. Yet he'd learned God's word. But again, remember we said, unless we apply it, unless it's mingled with faith and actually acting on it, it'll just drift over us. It'll drift over us. God is in the business of purifying us. What does the Bible say about the, the vine and the branches? Um, that which isn't bearing fruit is cut and throw away. But that which is bearing fruit, what does he do? The Bible says he prunes, he cleanses, he's pruning it back. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. But it does when you, you're a bit of a gardener like me or not. How do you make a, a, a plant or a tree or a bush or a rose or whatever or, or a tree stronger? By cutting it back at the right time, of course. Um, and I've got two bushes in the front of the house, which were really small when we got there. And I remember giving them a real hammering and Jackie was complaining. And I said, they'll come back much better. I said, a bit of hope in there. And I tell you what, they're massive. They're massive. Why? Because that's, that's how it works. We prune back. We prune back. And God is in the business of pruning. And pruning is painful, isn't it, sometimes? Pruning is painful. When God puts his finger on us and says, Dave, it's time for that, time for that to go. Dave, it's time to actually implement that now. It's time to actually uh, do away with that. Put that aside for a time and spend that time with me. Ah, Lord, help us. His word, what does the Bible says? He washes us with, he's the one who cleanses us. Jesus, of course, he washes us with his word. Again, fellowship. Fellowship is a great place where we get beautified. Iron sharpens iron. Um, and that could mean we can encourage each other, help each other, or actually wind each other up. And you say, well, Dave, I don't like that. Well, you know what? It, it tells me, and, and I've said this before, it tells me more about me than that person. That person is doing something or saying something or being, it's just rubbing me up the wrong way. It tells me more about me than that person. Because I'm it's just saying, Dave, there's a bit more work to be done in your character, in your fruitfulness. And God longs to do that. Uh, the Bible says, look out for each other to see if our hearts are not drifting away. If our hearts are not getting hard by sins, deceitfulness. Look out for each other. Purity. Get yourself right. Purify yourself, even as you are pure, as you see the day approaching. James 4 says, draw near to God. Wash your hands. Purify your hearts. You double-minded. God loves his church. And uh, because we are his, because we are his body, um, he longs for us. He longs for us to um, reflect him, reflect him. True story uh, in Russia many, many years ago. And, uh, of course, they couldn't meet. There's no such thing as church. There was the state church, but that wasn't really a church per se. But the real people of uh, godly believers met in houses, would, would gather together. And they'd all come at different times. Wouldn't carry a Bible with them, obviously. Um, and uh, they would change house places uh, every week so they wouldn't be found out. But they were gathered in a particular house one day, and um, uh, there was a knock at the door. I don't know how many was in the church say about 20, 25, 30 maybe, in the front room. There was a knock at the door. There's some soldiers. And they came in, obviously armed, and said, um, if, if you want to walk away, if you want to deny your faith, if, you, if you're not really a Christian, 
you, we'll allow you to go now. Otherwise, you're either going to be imprisoned or we will shoot you. We'll shoot you. And uh, one by one, people began to leave with their head held, held down. Um, but there was just a nucleus left. I don't know, maybe a dozen left uh, with their children. And they were, you know, comforting them and said, you know, it'll be fine. And uh, as soon as everyone left, uh, these soldiers locked the door and said, right, brothers and sisters, carry on praising. He said, we, we went to a church a month ago and did the same thing, and we heard the gospel and got saved. He said, we wanted to be sure that everyone here would knew the Lord. He said, because we knew we can only trust those who will actually give their lives for the gospel. Ah, I wonder. Someone came in here this morning. Ah, how many of us would stay? It's a good question, isn't it? It's a good question. Because you know what? We can, God wants to trust us with his great gospel. And you know what? When we understand who we are, when they understand who he is and what he's done for us, he's building his church. He's using you. He wants to use you. It's time to stir yourself. Why are we going to use me tonight? What does the Bible say? Um, some come. The song, a hymn, a word, a prophecy, a Bible reading. Why? For the edification of the, of the body. God wants us to bless us. Blessing is not giving you everything you want. No, no, no. God is giving the best to make you what you should be. God's blessing is on us. And God wants to beautify you. Why? Because he wants to protect you. He wants, you know what the Bible says? He, he, to the, to the, the Bible says he wants the wisdom of God to be shown to the heavenly realms. He wants to be able to say, as he did with Job, as Satan came in, have you seen my servant Job? Have you seen my servant Job? How he trusts me. <laughs> Um, oh, you went through some difficulties? Absolutely. But how oh, he trusted me. God wants to beautify us and present us holy and presentable to him. Hey, let's pray. Let's break bread. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Bless your name this morning. Amen. Who's believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty. For us to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took our infirmities, carried my sorrows. We considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted, but he was pierced for my transgression. He was crushed for my iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Thank you, Father, this morning.